Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Penn State College of Medicine COVID-19 Echo Series. <clears throat> We're delighted to have you join us for another session, and we appreciate your taking weekend time to participate. My name is Jackie Sable. <clears throat> I'm a member of the Echo team, and I'll be facilitating today's session. A few quick announcements before we begin. <clears throat> if you've not already done so, please put your name, email address, and affiliation in the chat box for our record keeping purposes. Please stay muted unless you're speaking, but you may also use the chat for communicating. We realize that Q&A time is important to you, and we're trying to categorize and address as many questions as possible through our sessions. If you have questions that are not answered during today's session, we encourage you to submit them as possible case discussion items for future sessions. And the link to, sub to submit a case item is included in our follow-up emails. Uh, or you can always contact us directly at echo at psu.edu. Please remember that there is no personally identifiable information allowed. We are recording these sessions and we will be sharing all materials and recordings after each session. In the spirit of all teach and all learn, we'll be on a first name basis during sessions. Um, for those of you who are new to Project ECHO, our ECHO sessions will always begin with a brief lecture followed by a case discussion. And cases typically include a question or a challenge that you would want to address. These are a critical component of the ECHO model. So we, again, we encourage you to submit cases and these can be related to patients, preparedness policy, or whatever challenge um, or question you would like to generate discussion and ideas around. For today's session, Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner will discuss strategies to create a household plan of action. And a special thanks to Dr. James Hayden from Broad Top Area Medical Center, who will be sharing a case from his practice regarding best practices and algorithms for home management. Um, again, during the lecture, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. Um, we have a, a team of specialists from Penn State who are able to participate um, as their schedules permit, and they will also be helping to field questions. But please remember, this is an all teach, all learn environment. So everyone is encouraged to share both questions and answers. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Gavin for our brief lecture. Good morning, everyone. So today I'm gonna to make recommendations only. I'm going to talk about how to get your household ready for coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. I'm talking to you today from my basement. Why am I in my basement? Because for the past three weeks, I've been working in hospitals all around the country, helping train hospital staff. I focus on provider safety. I focus on frontline worker safety and ensuring that they are, can do their jobs in the hospital, but they also focus on being safe when dealing with the coronavirus virus that is new, it's novel, and our immune systems haven't seen before. So I've just come back um, from being up in Massachusetts for a week. Uh, I want to protect my family. So today I'm living in the basement. I'm keeping as much separation as possible from my kids, my dog, and my wife. Uh, I'm eating my meals down here, and I'm going to be here for quite a while as uh, we still have a lot to do for COVID-19. So again, everything I'm talking about today are my recommendations only. The outline today of the, the presentation is, is going to be in three sections. First section, I'm going to talk about create a household plan of action. Section two, put your household plan into action. Section three, evaluate the effectiveness of your household plan of action that is how to improve the plan that you've already put together for your family, your household, your loved ones. So in this first section, we're going to talk about how to create a household plan of action. I'm going to give you seven things you can do. And I think these are seven things that you can do relatively easily. They don't cost a lot of money, but if you haven't started putting into a, a plan for COVID-19 of what you would do when someone has symptoms, becomes ill or sick in your house, now is the time to think about it. It's still not too late. So the first step is talk with people who need to be in your plan. They could be family members, they could be neighbors, they could be people outside the area where you live. Understand that within the, the network, the community that we have, there are people that may be at high risk, 
based on their age, based on underlying medical conditions, just based on pregnancy or other worries that they have. So talk to everyone that needs to be in your plan and understand what their concerns are. Understand that this is a plan for you. It's for you in your household. And ensure that as you go through your plan, there's going to be some restrictions on what you can and can't do. And then you may need outside help. And that outside help may come from neighbours. So get to know your neighbours, because we are all neighbours in this, and we're all going to stop the transmission of coronavirus by the certain measures that we've been told to take to improve hygiene, but also to keep physical distance between each other. So get to know your neighbours. And when you get to know your neighbours, you'll find that there may be other neighbours that can help you. Uh, for example, if you had a sick person in your house and you wanted to go and do some shopping or pick up medication or go to the post office, maybe neighbours could help you do that. So within your own household plan, your neighbours are going to play a very significant role. And even in the area that I live here in Washington, D.C., we have people, neighbours, friends that are sick right now. Their symptoms aren't severe enough for them to go to hospital, but they're stuck in their homes. And we're working as a team of neighbours to ensure that every person at the moment that has symptoms, that is sick, or even that are highly vulnerable where they could have uh, due to risk factors, and we're worried about serious complications, we're doing the best we can with our household plan, our neighbor, neighbor plan, to ensure they have the best protection, but also to ensure that we can stop transmission within our community. Also identify any aid organizations in your community. There's lots of organizations in our local community that we may historically not be involved in. Church groups, for example. All communities throughout the US at the county level or the state level have a medical reserve corps. The medical reserve corps or MRC takes both medical and non-medical volunteers. And if you haven't signed up for the medical reserve corps where you live now, I would highly suggest that's one way that you can help. Here in Washington DC alone, last week we had, uh, had 1,600 people newly sign up to join the local medical reserve corps. And they're going to be provided training through videos and, and also some limited face-to-face, -face, but they're all going to have a role within the community as we see more cases. There are other organizations. I'm, I was in the military for 12 years, and there's a military organization of volunteers in the US called Team Rubicon. And I'm a volunteer with Team Rubicon. And, and usually with Team Rubicon, we just, we respond to disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, and other natural disasters. But right now, Team Rubicon, a volunteer group for military veterans, is responding throughout communities, uh, throughout the US, helping with, again, grocery shopping, deliveries of, of product and goods, picking up prescriptions, providing both emotional and also and support for people that are sick that can't leave their homes. So again, if you haven't explored and looked at what organizations is, exist in your community, now is the time to do it. Once you've learned who needs to be in your plan, you've spoken to your neighbors, you've looked at other aid organizations or community groups, you then need to create an emergency contact list. Now, for any medical emergency, life-threatening situations, you can call 911. That's your priority. But also on this emergency contact list, you should put down who's in your plan, the family members, neighbours, friends, others that will help you if anyone in your household gets sick. Others, uh, uh, others that may be able to help you from the outside. You may not know them very well at the moment, but now's the time to put them down, put, the, put them, list them by name, by phone number, by email, and work at how to contact them if you need any help. And of course, you need to have those medical care contact, emergency contact lists readily available. Make the list, put it on the fridge, or hang it up somewhere in your house so every household member can see this, both for the hospital, the public health department, your local physician, medical provider, uh, your local pharmacy where you pick up prescriptions, or any, uh, any other person that needs to be on that list. Maybe you've got pets, put down your veterinarian. So it's really important now that we have an, we create an emergency contact list that is available in our house for everyone to see. If someone has symptoms, becomes ill or sick in your household, the first thing you want to do 
is isolate them in a room to prevent the other members of your household. So have a look at the floor plan of where you live, whether you live in a house or apartment, look at that floor plan and work out where I live at the moment, where is one area, one room that I can choose to isolate a sick household member. Now you may not have a perfect situation, you may not have two bathrooms, but if you have two bathrooms, then allocate one bathroom to any person or persons in the house that has symptoms. If you don't, then you have to, we will we'll focus on about what to do if you have one bathroom in, in a minute. But when you're in a household, identify that one room. If you can't seal that one room with a door, you can use a shower curtain, blankets, uh, plastic, hang them up over the entrance there to start creating barriers, to start creating physical barriers because we're really concerned about this virus coming out when someone's coughing, uh, but also touching things where someone may have coughed on. So again, if you haven't identified your room where you're going to isolate it, do it now. Also understand they'll still need to use the bathroom and work out a plan of how to do that. Also plan how to care. So anyone in your household that has regular prescription medications, look at the quantity, quantity that you have now. Are you able to get another month's supply, two months supply? Can you talk to your medical provider to write another prescription? Make those plans before someone gets sick. Also look at those medications that you'll need to decrease fever, aches and pains, and manage someone that will have symptoms of COVID-19. So again, then put those, those, those medications aside in a small container, small box or a, or a cupboard so you know where they are and they're easily accessible. Keep them, again, follow the safety regulations, keep them out of the reach of young children and animals, and also ensure that everyone knows that there are medications there that no one else should be touching. If possible, lock them up um, so that others can't, can't access these. So now start to plan how to care, identifying what medications you'll, you'll need. Also, plan how to care because a person who is sick or ill in your house is going to need food. Whether you're going to use paper plates, disposable, knife, fork or spoon, or whether you're going to use your normal everyday plates, bowls, that's okay with your normal everyday knife, fork and spoon, but we wanna keep those separated. Keep, keep the, uh, the, the utensils, the plates, everything separated. Use a plastic container, uh, use trays to serve food. When the person's finished eating, take away what they've, they've eaten, put it in a, in a plastic container, bring it back down to the sink. You can wash them in the sink or the dishwasher. If you wash in the sink, put on some rubber gloves to wash them up and then, and then let them dry. Remember, when someone is sick in our house, we don't share food. Any food that goes into a sick or ill person, it's for them and them only. We don't share that food. Identify also what food you have available. Do I have food where I can easily prepare food? Do, are there frozen meals, canned meals, packaged meals that will, make it, will take off the burden of preparing uh, meals in the kitchen and the time? So start to plan if someone was sick, and they're going to be sick for up to 14 days, understand you'll need at least 14 days of food for that sick or ill person. Hydration is so important when you have any respiratory infection, whether it be a cold, flu, or COVID-19. People are going to need fluids, water, juice, Gatorade, energy drinks, cups of tea, whatever they like, you need to ensure they have those, those fluids available for them. You'll probably be putting those fluids on, on a stand or next to their bed, so they're easily accessible by someone who is stuck in bed or stuck in a room in isolation. Use bottles, use straws, uh, use glasses that, again, you, you keep separate from everyone else in the house. So start to plan now, what is my fluid strategy? What is my hydration strategy? Knowing that someone, if someone in my household gets sick, their care is going to be up to 14 days, we know that, but they, they may be in a, in a situation where I may have to just leave them uh, bottles of fluid. I was in a situation two days ago in a hospital where the patient likes ginger ale, and instead of, he was calling the hospital staff regularly saying, oh, give me another can of ginger ale. We went out, we bought him 24 cans of ginger ale, we put it next to his bed, so that again, we can preserve uh, and conserve our personal protective equipment, but also, we're meeting the patient's needs. So again, you'll be meeting the patient's needs. They will be thirsty with a fever. Uh, they will need these fluids. So start to plan that now.
Everyone who gets sick in your household will still need to use a bathroom, the toilet, a shower, brush their teeth. Where you live now, if you went into your bathroom next to your toilet, do you keep your toothbrush there? Do you keep your hairbrush, makeup, right next to where your toilet is? If you do, take, those tooth, take the toothbrush, the hairbrush, and any other uh, cosmetics, really any other uh, personal items you have in the bathroom and put them in another room. Don't leave any of those personal hygiene items next to the toilet. Remove them now from the bathroom. Understand that if, a, if, we only have, if we have two bathrooms in a house, one bathroom is going to be designated for the sick person. If we have only one bathroom in the house, then we're going to have to ensure that we have minimum uh, of uh, products, personal hygiene items in that bathroom so it's easy to clean, but also every time that person that is sick goes and uses that bathroom, we're going to have to clean and disinfect. And again, clean and disinfect is a two-step process uh, the disinfectants that we're using for coronavirus don't work on dirty surfaces. And I'm going to talk more about that. So again, plan to care how to use a bathroom in your house to ensure that the sick person can use the, use the bathroom, as well as any other members of the household that we're trying to protect from getting sick as well. Laundry. You'll want to keep everything separate from the person that has the symptoms of a respiratory infection, is sick, is isolated in a room. So again, they'll need their sheets washed, they'll need their pillowcases washed, they'll need clothes washed, but you'll need to keep that separate. I would highly recommend getting a bag or a container that you can seal so that you can go in on a daily basis, pick up the dirty laundry, bring it down in a sealed container, down into, your, into to where your washing machine or your dryer is, put it in the washing machine, uh, use the detergent that you use already. There's no need to destroy clothes using bleach. Washing detergent will, will uh, inactivate or, or kill this virus. Put on a normal cycle. If you have a dry, use the dry. If you don't have a dry, then hang your clothes outside because this, this virus, the coronavirus, also can be killed and inactivated by sunlight. So again, keep laundry separate from everyone else in the house. That means you might have to use the washing machine more regularly throughout the day but that's important. After you use the washing machine, you do not need to specially clean it with any special products. Uh, so you can just keep doing other laundry as well. The detergent that you use will kill and inactivate this coronavirus. So again, keep that laundry separate, start having a plan on how to do that. In your household plan, when you've, when you've isolated that person with symptoms, in that room, that space that you've been able to put up physical barriers to prevent the spread of the virus. One person and one person in the house will go and meet the needs, the food, the hydration, medical laundry needs of that one person. So within your own household now, you need to start designating who that one person will be. There's a lot of things we can do if we understand how the virus infects us, how the virus gets inside our body and causes COVID-19. Remember that for, for the coronavirus to get inside our body, it has to go through our eyes, our nose, and our mouth. And I call that protecting your holes. That's why we're talking about don't touch your face. That's why there's so much emphasis on washing your hands effectively, properly, and, and getting them clean and, and, and doing this frequently. So it's important that we protect our eyes and nose and our mouth. And there's a lot of things we can do in the house to do that. If you look on this photo, there's a, there's a procedural mask. Some may call it a surgical mask. We are seeing communities across the US that are now making procedural masks at the community level. If you don't have one of those, there are ways you can make one yourself. They're available on the internet, or I can send you some links on how to do that. On the, on the top, top of this photo is a face shield. And again, we're seeing communities throughout the US getting together, working as teams, making face shields. You can, you can actually take a, a, an existing face shield, use that as your model, you replicate it, you cut out a piece of plastic and you use Velcro or material to allow for the strap to go around your head. Eye protection. So we've got to protect our nose, our mouth. Now we've got to protect our eyes. And here's a, a pair of uh, glasses that I wear. If I didn't have those glasses to protect my eyes, what else would I wear? I'd wear other spectacles. I'd wear sunglasses. I have worn 
a, a, a ski mask, uh, especially when, when I treated Ebola patients, but also now when I'm going into rooms with COVID uh, uh, patients or going to make home visits if I don't have eye protection. I've used a diving mask, anything that I can put over my eyes. We're now working in an environment where anything we have, having something is better than having nothing. So again, ensure that you protect the nose, the mouth and the eyes. Gloves. We don't want to use the medical gloves that, that hospital staff, first responders need. In this photo here is a pair of washing up gloves in your house. I put those on whenever I go into the room uh, where the sick person is with the symptoms. Uh, if I have to take food for them, if I have to give them water, fluids, if I have to pick up their laundry, if they need anything else, I would put these rubber gloves on. I would then come down, I would wash the gloves with soap and water and disinfectant. If I didn't have disinfectant, I would use soap and water and then I'd hang them outside to dry. Uh, again, and then the other important piece of equipment you should have is a thermometer. Right now, in the hospitals that I work in, all around the country, we are setting up wellness plans to get everyone to take their temperature twice a day. We don't often do that. And it's really important within your household, you understand that our temperature in the morning and in the evening is different. How many of us know what our normal temperature is when we don't have symptoms? Over three, a three day period, start taking your temperature in the morning and the evening and work out what is your normal body temperature. Because what we're seeing again, a lot with the COVID-19 patients that I've seen, is that many of them are feeling fatigue, they might have a scratchy throat, but a lot of them do have a low grade fever in those very early days of symptom onset. Not a high grade fever, a low grade fever, which is a, a, a one to one and a half degree increase. It's only a small increase, but we need to isolate people early. So again, if you don't know what the normal body temperature is of people in your house, then you start taking it now. But I think that everything I've shown here on what your own personal protective equipment is, could be, is easily attainable, low cost. Remember, protect your eyes, your nose and your mouth. The one other thing I wanna say about personal protection equipment, even when I'm working in hospitals, if I'm, or if I'm working in a home, or I'm looking after someone with symptoms, I want to put something on my body that also protects my clothes. And I'm wearing waterproof clothing at the moment. So I have a waterproof jacket, waterproof pants. If I don't have a waterproof jacket, I wear a waterproof poncho, the, the same sort of poncho I wear if I'm going to watch the baseball and it starts raining. That material can be washed with soap and water. Those materials, my waterproof jacket and my waterproof pants can be washed with soap and water and disinfectant, and then I hang them up uh, to dry. So again, even when I visit hospitals now, I don't want to use their Tyvek suits. I don't want to use their hospital gowns. So I will go into the hospitals now with my waterproof jacket on, my waterproof pants on, knowing that when I come out, we're washing and disinfecting them down before I take them off, that decreases, that inactivates, kills the virus and decreases the viral load. So again, you may have these things already. Uh, if you don't, then you may be able to get a poncho. You may be able to get a waterproof jacket. Ensure that you put something on top when you go into a patient that is coughing, has fever and has symptoms and is isolated. And again, that helps pre prevent that spread throughout the house. When you come out of that room, that's when you, when you, when you take off that personal, prote personal protection equipment and you start to clean and, and disinfect it. And, it's a, and again, I want to emphasize, if everyone can understand clearly how you get infected with coronavirus, it has to get inside your body, it has to get in through your eyes, your nose and your mouth. If coronavirus gets on your skin, you will not get sick. You wash it off with soap and water. So protect your eyes and nose and mouth. When you're handling the mask, or you're making your own mask, or you're handling your face shield, don't touch the front or the back or the inside of the face shield or the face mask. Hold it by the elastic uh, pieces, of, uh, pieces that we have attached to those masks. Put it on over your ears, put it on over your head. And when you take it off, it's really important you stay away from the front of your face, you reach behind the back of your head, and you take off that face shield from the back of your head. You take off the uh, procedural mask with these elastic loops from behind the ears, and you roll it forward away from your face. Again, what we're trying to do is protect your face, protect your eyes, your nose, and your mouth, and to keep those hands away at all times. So, this is what you really want to be. Be, be, um, we want to practice within your household how to do this well before you get someone with symptoms. 
Where do I store my face shield or my, my procedural mask when I'm not using it? I put it in a, in a Ziploc bag. I don't lay it down on any surfaces. I'll take it off, I'll put it into a Ziploc bag and that's where I zip it up and I keep it safe there. So this is something, again, you can start practicing, rehearsing and getting used to well before someone in your house gets sick. The other thing you'll need to do is choose your own cleaning and disinfection equipment. I want to emphasize, coronavirus is an envelope virus. Of all the germs that we have out there, it is the easiest of all the germs to kill or inactivate. Once that envelope that surrounds the virus is broken, the virus cannot cause infection in people. So it's really important that we start reading the label, start looking at the label of, of what the products uh, that we buy, and they tell us how to use them. They'll tell us the safety instructions, but they'll also tell them how long we need to keep surfaces wet. And that's called the dwell time or the wet contact time. Even when you pick up a, a packet of disinfecting wipes, it will say on the back that the surface needs to be kept wet for this many minutes. When you're using other disinfection, disinfectants, it will say on the label that it needs to be kept wet for this many minutes. Follow those directions. We oh, so often don't read the labels. The problem that I have when I, because of my age, when I try to read labels, I can't read the labels because the print is too small. So have someone else in the house read the label for you, or I have to get out my magnifying glass so I can see what the label says. You also should now start preparing in a bucket, in a con plastic container, your own disinfection equipment. I like spray bottles. I will fill up disinfections, disinfectants in a spray bottle and I will spray surface down, surfaces down and I'll keep them wet for that wet contact time to allow the chemistry of the product in my disinfectant to work. Now, re remember that the disinfectants that you buy at the store do not work on dirty surfaces. And surfaces can be dirty both by visible dirt and invisible dirt. So cleaning and disinfection is a two-step process. You have to clean the surface first, let it dry, and then you have to disinfect the surface in step number two and allow the chemistry of the product in the disinfectant to be wet long, long enough, as it says on the label, to inactivate or kill this virus. We don't do this often enough. So often when we clean, we clean to shine. Now we're cleaning to disinfect and kill virus. So again, it's a two-step process. The first step, you can use soap and water, or you can use the disinfectant and just clean the disinfectant and use this disinfectant twice. But if you're trying to conserve the amount of disinfectant you have, then definitely use soap and water on a surface, let it dry, then put your disinfectant that you've paid for on that surface at the appropriate wet contact time to allow it to work. Again, when you read the label, and I have to, again, for me personally, I have to use my magnifying glass because the print on the back of those labels is too small. Right now, when you choose your own disinfectant, you should be looking at buying an EPA registered disinfectant for SARS-CoV-2. That is the name of the coronavirus that causes coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. Where do I find this list? On this website here. This is the EPA registered disinfectant list for SARS-CoV-2. There are over 350 products listed on that list. Now, when you purchase a product, how do you know it's EPA registered? On the label of the product is an EPA registration number. It's on the, it's on the label on the product. You then have to go to the website and see if that EPA registered number is on this website. Again, there's over 350 numbers listed. If it's a match, then you know the product can be used to kill or inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Again, look at the product label. You'll find it listed as an EPA registered number. Again, I wish I could make this easier, but I can't. But they, those numbers are there. And then start going through the products, the disinfectant products you have now, look at the disinfectant wipes, look at the other cleaning products you have and see if they have EPA registered numbers on them and then look them up on this website. 
I'm very sorry I can't make this any easier, but that's the way it is. It takes some time, but if you take the time to plan now, it'll give you the confidence and you'll know for sure that you're using a registered disinfectant that will kill and inactivate SARS-CoV-2. So I've covered seven things to do in how to create, create a household plan of action. Just in summary to go over these, talk with people who need to be in your plan, get to know your neighbors, identify aid organizations in your community, think about volunteering, create an emergency contact list, choose a room to isolate sick household members, plan how to care with someone that has, is sick with symptoms and has to be isolated, medications, food, fluids, bathroom, laundry. Choose your own personal protective equipment and choose your own cleaning and disinfectants. So these are seven things I think that everyone can do now. Uh, again, it takes a little bit of time, but again, once you have your household plan in action, then you need to tell everyone within your household uh, what that plan is. And you need to also share, share those plans between your neighbors because again, making the first draft of that plan, we can only improve and get better as we go on. And that's something that everyone should be doing right now. So what do we do? What do we do when someone has symptoms of a respiratory infection, whether it be a scratchy throat, nasal congestion, fever, aches and pains, how do we put our household plan with the seven things I've just outlined into action? Well, the reason that I want everyone to develop a household plan is that if we can isolate those with symptoms early, we're going to decrease the risk, decrease the spread, the transmission of this virus between other people. And the reason we're telling everyone to stay home is we're trying to protect preserve our national hospital system. We're trying to protect the first responders. We're trying to protect all those that have to go to work each day to treat people for a number of different medical conditions. So the reason we're asking you to stay at home is so we can protect those frontline workers. And if everyone understands that, hopefully they'll say, well, gosh, I'm doing something good today. I'm trying to protect others by following my household plan. And so, as you get that message out, understand that there's many of us that still have to go to a hospital each day, and we still have to come home and, 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 and stay somewhere. This is why I'm living in the basement right now. So if everyone, your kids, your grandparents, parents, family members, friends, understand why we're developing a household plan and why we need to implement it when someone's ill with symptoms. But I also want to emphasize that if you have respiratory symptoms, fever, scratchy throat, difficulty breathing, nasal congestion, you should ring a health provider for advice. If you develop emergency warning systems for COVID-19, you then need to call 911 and you need to tell the operator that you have or think you might have COVID-19 or tell them you have respiratory symptoms. And I wanna just highlight from the US CDC website, some of those emergency symptoms or warning signs that include difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, confusion or ability to arouse, bluish lips or face, are some of the emergency warning signs that the CD, US CDC website lists now that you should treat this as an emergency and call 911. Again, this list is not all inclusive. You call 911 or if you have a direct line to a medic provider for any other symptoms that are severe or concerning. When you go to a hospital right now, in many of the locations throughout the US where you live, you'll see the hospitals look different. In the hospitals that I'm working with throughout the US right now, we've set up special staging areas, triage areas, where you might drive into the car park and someone dressed in personal protective equipment will ask you questions about your symptoms and why you're coming to visit the hospital day. You may see tents set up in the hospital or outside the hospital. And those tents, again, are again to protect 
all the hospital staff and the environment within that hospital. You'll see tents where those with respiratory symptoms should go to and tents where those that do not have respiratory symptoms should go to. When you come into a hospital, you may see colors, you may see tape on the ground, you may see signs. Those signs will be colored green, yellow or red. A green tape on the ground or a green sign are the areas where you can go to and someone will come in and ask you questions. If you go to a hospital and you see yellow tape on the ground or red tape on the ground, or you see a yellow sign or a red sign, do not go past that area. Stop. Stop and wait to talk to a hospital a staff member or a medical provider or someone who works there and ask them, what should I do? Do not go across those yellow or red zones because they're the areas we're trying to protect. And so many of the hospitals I work in now have set up these different zones. So it's really important that it takes a little bit more time to get to the hospital. Again, emergency warning signs, life-threatening situations, you have to, have to tell someone, I have a life-threatening situation. They know how to deal with that. So again, you'll see that hospitals aren't looking uh, like they usually do. Uh, we have set up systems within the hospitals where all the staff enter one area and then they exit other areas. We create, for the hospital staff that I work with in now, we are asking them questions throughout the day uh, about how they feel, we're taking their temperatures, but we're also ensuring that every hospital staff member in the hospitals that I work in actually have a household emergency plan, just like the one that I'm outlining here to you today, because they need to ensure that they can protect their loved ones. With a ill person in your house with symptoms, that one person who's de designated to provide care for that person, in a room where you've tried to isolate them, either by putting them in a separate room or putting up physical barriers, whenever you approach that person, if possible, they should wear a procedural mask. If they can't, then try to see if they can wear one of those face shields. What we're trying to do here now, if a person is coughing, even when they're breathing and talking, if they're ill with symptoms, they will be spreading virus particles. And we want to decrease that spread, that, uh, that uh, emission of virus particles from someone that has symptoms. So again, the patient, the person who's sick should wear a procedural mask or a facial if they physically can. But anyone who goes in to that room to care for the sick person, again, needs to focus on protecting eyes, nose and mouth. Again, we're seeing so many people in the community. And I can't be so, I'm so thankful that this is happening, making procedural masks and making facials because, again, they're taking all the, um, the, the valuable personal protective equipment that we are trying to get in our hospitals, but they're making in the community. So many of us that have to look after someone within our house actually has some form of protection. When someone is sick with symptoms in your house, you need to continue practicing everyday preventive actions. Cover coughs, sneezes with a tissue. Dispose of those tissues properly in sealed containers or sealed bags. Don't leave them laying around on surfaces. Wash your hands often and properly with soap and water. You need to wash the front of your hands, the back of your hands, between the fingers, the fingers, under the fingernails, and don't forget that area between the thumb and finger and wash your thumbs. We know that if you wash your hands properly and effectively with soap and water, it takes about 20 seconds or when you sing the happy birthday song twice. Everyone in where you live at home should have available water. Again, if you don't have available water, you can also use a hand sanitizer. But I would encourage if you have available running water in your home, then use soap and water. We need to understand we need to start cleaning more frequently, clean touch surfaces, objects. You can clean them with a pre-clean, a step one clean with soap and water or disinfectant. The step two is when you use your EPA registered disinfectant. And remember those disinfectants don't work on dirty surfaces and dirty surfaces can be both visible and invisible. I can't emphasize enough. Read the label and keep the surface wet long enough for the recommended time by the manufacturer to ensure that we inactivate or kill this coronavirus. Follow product precautions, such as wearing, wearing gloves, and also 
in areas where you're cleaning, you can open a window or a door to provide good ventilation. Again, if possible, if a person is sick with symptoms, use a separate room and bathroom for the sick household members. If it's not possible, you can put up physical barriers, curtains, shower screens, blankets, plastic sheets. Provide the sick household member with a clean face mask or face shield. Do not share food, drinks, plates, utensils between the person with symptoms and other household members. Here's another area you may not have thought about, and this is something I do in hospitals. I want all household members to have outside clothes and inside clothes. And have an area in your house where you can wear your outside clothes, come into your house and change out of your outside clothes and put on your inside clothes. And those inside clothes always stay inside. What I'm doing in hospitals where I work right now, everyone who works in a hospital, the clothes, the scrubs they wear around the hospital each day stay in the hospital. They don't go home, they don't go out of the hospital, they stay in the hospital and they, get, and they go to the laundry in the hospital. Any hospital staff, doctors, nurses, or any other hospital staff that come into the hospital are wearing outside clothes to the hospital. They change from their outside clothes into their, into their hospital scrubs. They enter the hospital. As they're coming out, they change out of those hospital scrubs, again, back into outside clothes. When they go home, they change out of those outside clothes into inside clothes. This takes a little bit of planning, a little bit of practice, but please, everyone, outside clothes, including footwear, should be kept outside and inside. You should have clean inside clothes, including clean inside footwear that doesn't go outside. If we can all start doing that, that will also help just to prevent and decrease the amount of transmission of the coronavirus. Stay in touch with others. Again, we're using cell phones. Um, again, we're using the, the way that we need to stay in touch, whether it be through telephone calls, uh, text messages, uh, video conferencing. This is the key right now. Even when someone is sick and ill in a room, we can provide uh, a tablet, a phone, that we can talk to them if they need to ask us questions. So use the technology that you have available. I want to emphasize the wellness programs that I have set up in hospitals include asking questions throughout the day, when you start work, when you leave work, but also throughout the workday. How do you feel? Do you have any symptoms? Are you eating enough food? Are you drinking enough drink to, drinks to stay hydrated? But also ensure, if you haven't started taking household members temperature twice a day, now is the time to do it. Understand what those normal body temperatures are, both in the evening and uh, in the morning. Part of your plan is to take care of the emotional health of your household members. That includes conversations, dialogue, coping skills, games, ways that we can uh, address any anxiety that we have. And there is a lot of anxiety. And that anxiety is not just from a, a virus disease called coronavirus, but it's also financial, social, environmental, intellectual, physical, spiritual. So again, ensure that people that within your household, the neighbors, your friends you have, that we start coming up with ways and opportunities for addressing those emotional health needs. Just like we do when I teach disaster medicine, Anyone that responds to me for any disaster, I'm sure they have coping skills. I'm sure that we set up what's called a buddy system, uh, either a, group, a team of two or a team of three, where we can all check in on each other and talk about and listen about our concerns. Once the plan has been written, again, you can evaluate the effectiveness of your plan. So even before you get someone sick in your house, evaluate, practice, train, teach, Rehearse what's in your plan, see if it works, and always strive that every time you sit down with household members, neighbors, or even if you practice and rehearse something, it's called doing a drill, you can start improving your plan. So evaluate the effectiveness of your household plan of action, listen to feedback, listen to ways that may make things easier. If you find there's something that's not in your plan, add it to your plan. And I just wanna finish up with some of the guidelines, the references that I use every day to develop household uh, plans of action for COVID-19. But I also want to emphasize that this is not new. We've been developing plans of action at the household level, at the neighborhood level for pandemic flu. 
for Ebola, for other highly infectious diseases. So you can see here that, yes, that uh, the US Center for Disease Control has brought out uh, documentation on how to get your household ready for COVID-19, but they already had documentation on their website for how to get your household ready for pandemic flu. Again, I've provided the web link here for the EPA list of registered disinfectants that can be used against SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, how to kill and inactivate them, and that list is available on this website. I wanna thank everyone. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a couple of comments that I'd like to share. I'm going to put a, a call out to um, some of our panel panelists who are here today to address some questions. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hayden because I think it's a perfect, your talk has been a perfect segue into what he's going to be sharing from his perspective. So a couple of quick comments. Um, everybody is interested in any links that you have regarding um, how to make masks. And a few people did share some links to that al already. Um, Marie, thank you for your generous offer. She has a team who is able to 3D print face shields and um, offered that she, if you message her, she can work with you on that. Um, in terms of some questions that came in, again, I'm gonna, going to mention them here and I'm encouraging anybody from our panel or you, Gavin, if you can address these via the chat or email us, we'll make sure that everybody gets access to the responses. I know um, Jen has been um, fielding some questions in the chat, but again, if there's anything to add to that. So some of the questions is ibuprofen okay? Jen mentioned, I believe that we're still not clear on that, but again, feel free to respond to that in the chat. Um, and a, a few questions regarding mental health of um, physicians who might be isolated from their family. Also, um, for those who are, are asymptomatic but may be breastfeeding um, or pumping. So again, please feel free to contribute to those. I want to transfer kind of segue into Dr. Hayden's case. Um, Gavin, I think you mentioned um, advice on ringing your, your, I loved ringing your provider for advice during this time. And I think Dr. Hayden um, is going to be able to share some of the things that his facility has been doing in terms of communicating with those who may be at home. So with that, I'm gonna sh uh, turn things over to Dr. Hayden. Hi all, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, two quick comments. Um, I don't understand the full specifics of it, but the, the Pennsylvania Department of Health in our uh, statewide and uh, acute care meetings uh, stressed that when we're preserving the masks, they want them stored in a paper bag as opposed to a plastic bag. And, and it has something to do with them being able to breathe, stay dry, and maintain function. So I, I don't know if you put them in with your breath condensation, that might make the fibers stickier or something. I don't know exactly, but they specifically said use paper bags, not plastic. Um, the other thing, so other thing for the household um, that uh, we talk to people about is people using nebulizers, uh, CPAPs or BiPAPs. Um, they, as you know, as medical providers, uh, are great for creating aerosols and you know, again, uh, the degree of aerosolation may affect the distribution of it throughout the household. And so um, two simple things, depending on what the weather is like, actually may help in that regard. One is a small box fan uh, with a HEPA filter that you would normally put on a furnace uh, in the recipient's room if the weather is nice enough uh, to not just blow it out the window, but catch it in a HEPA filter and create a negative pressure room, so to speak, less likely spreading outside the room they're in. Um, if that can't be done because the weather's foul, the other uh, quick solution is reminiscent of the old mist tents that we used uh, for the uh, croup kids. And that is, you can get uh, construction storage bags that are uh, five feet by uh, eight feet and create basically a little tent. 
uh, you weight two sides of it and you leave the other two sides free. Um, you basically hang it over the patient from the ceiling um, and uh, you use a one of the small shop backs with a HEPA filter in it. And you, of course, put the shop back into that uh, tent. Um, you'll need a piece of cardboard around the uh, hose so that you don't suck the immediately adjacent plastic into the hose, but you can create a little bit of a negative pressure tent. Uh, again, when they're using their nebulizers, when they're using their BiPAPs or CPAPs, there'll be less aerosolation through the rest of the, the home, um, if that makes sense to anybody. Um, on to what we were talking about, uh, the big issue from our perspective is education and making sure the people do things in the right sequence. As uh, uh, the good doctor alluded to, um, we need to protect the uh, caregivers uh, as well. We kind of uh, put together informational uh, uh, pieces for patients in that regard. And also, while it's not common, we also put them as having a stake in it as potentially uh, coming to the office and picking up a secondary infection on what they already had. It's not the biggest problem with this virus, but it isn't not a problem either. And so the sequence of events that we have used is we start um, with uh, our telephones and we have a message on the telephone uh, asking people uh, to uh, um, learn a little bit about the uh, COVID virus remind them that they shouldn't go to any medical facility without calling that facility first, whether it's our office, the lab, x-ray, or the hospital uh, itself. Um, when they come to our office, they'll be greeted by a large poster that occupies most of the glass of the door uh, with a big stop sign on it, uh, asking them that if they are uh, coughing significantly to return their, to their car and call us. Um, if they're coughing and wish to come in, that as soon as they enter the door, they use sanitizer and they apply a mask. And we ask them to do it in that sequence because the box of masks, if they really truly have things, could be contaminated uh, by them doing that first. So we ask them to gel first. Um, then when they approach our receptionist, our receptionist uh, uh, issues a questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire to this point in time emphasized the issue of travel or exposure to someone who had traveled and was symptomatic, uh, either outside or in the US. And we keep a uh, uh, poster up uh, beside the receptionist and beside the nurses area uh, that we, um, highlight in on the map uh, where the hot zones are as of this point in time uh, each day. Um, the, if the screens are in fact uh, positive, the patients are asked to return to their vehicle and wait, uh, or they can return home if they're not in any significant distress um, and await us having contacted uh, the uh, Department of Health. Um, and uh, make arrangements notifying them uh, for testing. Um, and uh, then we either go out, uh, mask, uh, gloves, uh, and uh, instruct them on what was decided, or we call them at home and tell them what was decided. Uh, there is a uh, handout from the CDC, as the good doctor alluded to as well, that outlines um, what you need to know and if you are sick with the COVID-19 virus. And we uh, supply that to them. And then we go over uh, patient-specific issues with them. This part is done by a provider. Um, and uh, that includes such things as I just alluded to with regard to uh, the uh, utilization of the tent or a pseudo uh, negative pressure room. Um, and uh, that uh, is what we try to do. We give them the list of the signs that you were just uh, given 
uh, from the CDC with regard to the red flags that they need to contact us and let us know that they need to change from home management uh, to management uh, in a more acute care setting. Um, but again, they are not to go anywhere without calling. Uh, we are more than happy to make the arrangements and transition uh, and get the information back to them as to how and why they will enter uh, the uh, ER or the hospital, depending on the time of day. It may be a direct admission. If it's the middle of the night, it will likely be uh, through uh, the emergency room. So um, I think that uh, for the most part covers uh, what we talked about. Um, and, and the uh, documents themselves I did provide, all except for the one on the nebulizer. Every, every time I went through this to review <laughs> this stuff, I realized there was another document that we had created that I hadn't sent. And I apologize to Jackie for that. So um, real, real quickly, if you don't mind, um, I think if we go to the next slide, um, you have a bit of um, an informational message for, for your telephone. I just yeah. wanted to mention that briefly before we um, go to any final questions here. Mm -hmm. So if you can yeah. share that process. And it's, as I said, it, it, it's uh, what uh, we uh, believe is important for them to uh, know. It's a brief description of uh, the uh, COVID virus uh, in um, layman's terms. Uh, we tried to have it to a sixth grade education. So that's part of the reason why it's not necessarily in jargon people are familiar with. Um, it uh, talks about uh, the uh, idea of the contact, uh, the typical symptoms of COVID, what you need to do to uh, prevent uh, spreading. Um, it uh, also uh, reinforces the call ahead message uh, and uh, the fact that for the most part, unless you're having uh, the red flag sy symptoms of uh, severe shortness of breath, uh, chest discomfort, uh, altered mental status, et cetera, then the best place for you, again, to be treated is, in fact, your own home. And again, playing into both issues, the need to protect them from potential secondary infection and the need to protect others from uh, spread of uh, the virus. I was told that this entire message uh, could not be put on the phone and it was abbreviated. This is the script I provided to them, but apparently I was a little too long-winded. So. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your script and this will be included in the slides that go out if anyone wants to take it or an abbreviated version. Um, there's a lot going on in our chat. Gavin, thank you for responding to things, um, especially regarding um, PPE and maintaining those devices um, and it looks like the going with Tylenol is, is what's coming across. So Gavin, I'm going to turn it over to you for any last minute um, questions or responses. And also if anyone has anything for, for Jim, please feel free to put it into the chat. And again, we will continue to follow up on all of this. Yeah, thank you, Jack. And I agree with Dr. Hayden. This question, we need to be clear on the reuse of masks. Uh, again, if you're using uh, a way to protect your nose and your mouth with cloth, then you need to ensure that you laundry, you clean that as often as possible. With the procedural surgical masks, don't get them wet. Uh, they will become wet through breathing and talking. Uh, again, we're, we're, not, we're not using substances to, uh, or any product to clean those because we don't want them to get wet, but we are hanging them up. Uh, again, as Dr. Hayden mentioned, and I've talked about before, on paper bags so that the air can circulate around them. But if you're doing that within your house, you need to ensure that that, that paper bag that you hang the mask on the handle is put somewhere safely. Better if you can if you can hang it outside. Again, keep people away from it as well because it will it will be uh, contaminated with virus. So this is really important. But what we're seeing right now, say in the neighbourhood that I live, 
the neighbours, the community are making so many of these masks on a day-to-day -day basis that we're nearly getting, just in my small neighbourhood, to the ability where we can not have to reuse those procedural masks. Not everyone will have that, that those resources available. I know a number of you may only have one mask that you need to reuse, but again, understand how you get infected by this virus through your eyes, your nose, your mouth, and do it safely. So one final question before we wrap up. Um, <laughs> Is an air ionizer filtering device helpful, such as using an air ionizing filter in a bedroom or COVID positive space? So that's something that we'd have to check with the manufacturer's guidelines and direct. And, and, and again, I can, I can follow that up uh, afterwards, Jackie, as well, uh, to see what sort of product that is. Again, we're seeing lots of products being put out there. Again, I'd go back to the manufacturer's guidelines and then we can make a, a decision based on our risk assessment. That would be wonderful, thank you. Um, and thank you all for participating. A reminder that you are able to collect CME credits for participating. Um, survey is always sent after our sessions. Remember one session, or I'm sorry, one survey for each session that you attend, and you can continue to use the same link for those. Um, as we've been mentioning, all materials from today will be shared. Um, we do have a resource folder, and um, we will continue to keep that updated. If there are any questions that were not addressed today, please put them in the chat or email them to us. And we hope you will join us for our next ECHO session scheduled for 8 a.m. on Tuesday. Um, and that will address COVID-19 in Pennsylvania nursing homes. Um, please continue to watch your email. We are working on next week's schedule and I do believe one will be around um, mental health in particular for providers, um, but continue to watch and thank you for spending a bit of your Saturday with us.